Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of The Ladies Fixing the World. We will never give up. In the end, we will actually fix the world. I have with me my amazing friends, the same as always, Luna from Denmark, Kali from Tenerife, and Sarah from Australia. Let's just jump right into it. We decided we wanted to talk about attachment parenting and how that will sort of digress into unschooling in a natural path, but also about mm, some of the nuances, the way that you're not fucking it up because you don't do attachment parenting from the second you think about having a child. So Mm -hmm. this theme is very interesting and how these things are all interconnected. So Mm -hmm. I will give the talking stick to Sarah. She has an opening. Thank you. Yes. Some of our, I I guess our conversation starters within this forum are born out of the things that we talk about naturally amongst ourselves, the things that we talk about with parents who might ask us questions and, you know, ponderings and experience from our own lives. So this issue uh, of attachment has comes up all the time in most, I would say, most unschooling families, even if we don't realise it, even if people aren't familiar with that language. And some of you might know that Luna and I have been living together this year. Uh, and so we have a lot of conversations in the kitchen <laughs> over coffee. And it just so happens that this one was coming up a lot recently. And, and we were talking about attachment wounds and things like that on, on our own social media profiles and having lots of really robust and sometimes challenging conversations with parents who maybe don't even know really what that means because the term's been popularised. So we're going to do a bit of like, I don't know if it's going to be myth-busting, but some some dialogue around what attachment, the significance of attachment, um, hopefully some comfort in terms of, you know, what, what to do if you didn't know about this stuff when you first had children, which I did not. 15, 16 years ago, Um, and then how this naturally and quite organically can, for many families, lead into a values-based unschooling life. Yeah? Sound good? So where where do we start? I mean, we should (laughs) probably talk about this for about 30 hours to cover the whole field. (laughs) (laughs) But maybe... Uh, Can I have a question? Can I make a question? Yeah. Okay, Uh, because... In in Spanish, uh, mm-hmm. usually the word that we hear more now is not uh, attachment, but respectful parenting. So maybe you can explain me the difference, if it is a different in this concept. Yes. Like respectful parenting or attachment yes. parenting. Yes. It isn't the same thing exactly, or or at least the starting point might be different. So attachment parenting has kind of come to be a very fashionable uh, label for a particular style of parenting, right, which could also cover respectful parenting, conscious parenting, natural parenting. People use all sorts of different. But but really when I use it, and I won't speak for anybody else, when I talk about attachment, I'm really talking about biology. I'm not really talking about a style of parenting, um, I'm not talking about something that you've read about in a book. I'm talking about how we're wired biologically, particularly as mothers, right? Dads get a bit triggered when I talk about this stuff because there's a lot of like, what about me? I'm talking about the biology of a mother connecting with her newborn child from the moment they're born, actually before, but, you know, I'm talking about how we're wired. I'm talking about the hormonal exchange that's absolutely crucial. I'm talking about how the blueprint for our parenting and our mothering is handed down in our DNA. And and if we get it wrong, and that doesn't mean we can't fix it, but if we do miss that stuff, that's a rite of passage that hasn't been, hasn't happened. So it isn't just, because this has been a very big journey for me, it isn't just Um, I have to sleep with my child, I have to hold them 16 hours a day. Because when I was a new parent, I was looking up all these styles of parenting. And what I came across was rules. So I'm like, oh, attachment parenting is these rules. And I'm like, I don't like rules. So I can't follow this prescription. Um, But years down the track and a lot of unraveling, uh, because this stuff brings up our own shit, uh, my 
my view or my lens around attachment is all about bio biology and imprinting. And that then does naturally have a flow on effect, of course, to potentially respecting our children in a different way. But the portal is early attachment. So, and that's also, about how our bodies and our brains as mothers and infants work. And that's that's not airy fairy written in a book. That's like biology. That's truth. So is that I controversial? Think it, I, I think it's also, I mean, it's the same people probably talking about attachment parenting and respectful parenting. And I think if you have your attention on attachment and you get what that's all about, it's 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 hard to treat your child disrespectfully. I mean, it, it sort of walks hand in hand, mm. but the attachment concept is a concept that stems from the field of psychology. It was first described in the 1950s and it's been misunderstood many times and it's been used backwards. And there are, it's about in the short way how a child who is met by his mother or her mother from the very beginning who can express needs or just express discomfort and be met by understanding and someone trying to do their best to meet their, the needs of the child this will form a secure attachment and there are only three kinds of attachment secure insecure and disrupted or i can't remember the exact term but when it's chaotic that's really bad and and so with this if, if you get the idea that you have to pay attention to your child's attachment that you cannot ignore uh, expressions of needs and you have to be there to understand what the child is saying and try to meet the needs as soon as possible the younger they are the more urgent it is then the risk of 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 the child growing up without the respect of the parents is is quite it's a weird idea to get i mean it it, it would it would naturally be part of it because the base of of paying attention to your child's need and knowing that your job is to actually support the child's life so that these needs are met always and it's your job you're not a servant it's not I mean I hear many parents sort of whine about it but that's the job you made the child now it's your problem and your job is to be there to meet the needs of the child if, if you get that then respect doesn't even have to be mentioned I think I mean obviously you respect the child. But I, I think that's actually really the crux of the problem today is that like Sarah talked about the biology and I think for a lot of parents the thing is that they they hear they know they feel the biology they want to respond to their child the infant crying etc but then they are sort of like trained out of it by all of the societal messages and cultural messages about oh you shouldn't respond immediately as they whine because they'll just learn that you know you'll be at their every whim and blah 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 all these messages that they are what come in and destroy the natural in, like the intuition we know as mothers and I also think fathers know like the mother's biology uh, biology is different in, um, with relation to the child of course we they were in our womb right for nine months so we're connected in a different way um, that's what happens when you know your milk starts running before the child cries and stuff like that because you're like connected in a different way but we are trained out of it by all sorts of I don't know weird ideas and things that come up and so so I think that's I think that's just really why it's so important to talk about it because it's the same that that's also what you see then later on, later down the road. That's also what you see in unschooling. We know, we understand the natural way of learning because there's also some biology and some something about how humans are wired to learn and how learning takes place. We know it, but then we second guess ourselves. Parents second guess themselves because they're told all sorts of stupid stuff from the school paradigm. And it's 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 all it's all so weird. 
I think. How, how I think everyone knows it. We all know it from the beginning. We have the biology, we have the the intuition, we the instincts, all that, but it's just yeah, trained out of everyone. There is a huge mainstream thing going on trying to teach us how to parent. It's funny you mentioned before, Sarah, the rules when you looked up how to be a good parent and there were so many rules and and um, maybe they were actually just, you know, expressions like, well, that's another story. But there are within the mainstream parenting also a lot of rules and a lot of do's and don'ts that are really weird but are being repeated all the time so many times and and they are being told and retold and and people even write books about them uh i i i i'm not sure i want to go down the rabbit hole of the sleeping book but it was horrible when it came out and i mean it was sold in millions of copies and it it so much trauma derives from that single book a common friend you luna and i have um actually once started uh, buying them <laughs> to make a big fire in her garden just to do something about it the less on the market the better it's 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 hard because we we grow we are all probably all wounded by this we have all attachment issues because we are the first generation where most of the generation was institutionalized from very young age. So yes, we have natural instincts, but we also have pain and we also have confusion because we don't have the perfect prop. I don't know your all exact stories, but if we have been to, to nursery and kindergarten, good chances are that we have attachment problems with our own, in our own story. So yes, when we have children, we have a lot of, good instinct going on but there is also the re-traumatization of our own childhood coming up there's the chaos there's the sleep deprivation and then there's this choir of people telling us not to pick up the child it's good for the lungs if they scream that they will become this that and the other if we respond to their needs and isn't it a little bit crazy to breastfeed them now that they are three and a half seconds old i mean it's it's it let's not talk about this as if it's easy because it's natural no, it's and it could have been easy if it wasn't destroyed by the society that we live in and the personal stories that we have if we had had sisters if we four had lived together in in just the same street had someone to talk to to, to who sort of had their brains still um then it might have been easy but doing it in the context of the modern society where one of the stories I was told all the time was, you know, how will you have a career? You know, all the freedom rights your mother and grandmother and great grandmother fought for. Are you just going down the rabbit hole of parenting and giving up all of that? Isn't that a little unfair to your ancestors? No, I don't think so. But it was pushed hard on me. I was at university when I became a mother and, and the whole academia was against the mothering basically get rid of that child put it in nursery and, and read your books mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I was doing my phd when i got pregnant and it was like the worst moment in the world doing your phd and i'm like yes but i want to be i don't want to be an old mother i think so it was already i mean i was 29 i don't know if it's old or not but it's like i don't want to be 40 i want and then I was thinking, like, it would be the same after a PhD if you are a researcher. That was my whole thing. So if I cannot do it now, I, I won't be able to do it later. I want it now. Yeah, and then I asked, I, I remember this particular teacher telling me, uh, my wife was like 40 or something. And I was like, yeah, but I want to be younger. And then he was like, yes, the energy is not the same. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I can sign that one. I had a child when I was 23 and it was easy peasy. And I had my last child when I was 37. That was different. And I'm not having any more now. <laughs> Grandchildren. 
please. Yeah, I mean, you know, that brings up the, I mean, we talk about this a lot, social engineering, which is all part of breaking breaking um, the attachment and separation, et cetera. You know, the, the idea that it's better to have children in your 30s rather than the biologically normal age, which is probably in your teens. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and that's people, that's like a horrifying idea for people nowadays, the idea that teenagers would be, and in fact, we're told that it's wrong, but biologically, that's probably when we would be in our prime and the grandparents would be young enough still to actually be involved in a way that many of them are not now because many grandparents don't want to be involved because they're like, well, I'm retiring and I'm going around Australia in my caravan now. So see ya because they're knackered, because they had children when they are in that age 20. So, it, like, it's so interesting how, you know, on reflection you can see all of the ways that, as Luna said, we've been not only trained out of our instinct but that our social habits, our natural social habits, have been engineered to now look nothing like how they really should look if we were looking at our biology and our ancestry. And also, you know, bringing in the school piece that we now believe that as much as we have to train babies to go to sleep because they couldn't possibly learn how to sleep on their own or or even that they need to learn, that they also can't learn how to read on their own. They also can't learn how to take care of their hygiene needs on their own, you know, that they need to be scheduled. And it's, it's such a short period, this engineering, this interruption has happened in such a short period of time such a short period of time yeah which means I reckon that it's actually not fully embedded yet and we've still got time to like turn it around it is also hard to really work against nature Mm -hmm. nature will still be there no matter how much we try to destroy it um so yes we can we can save it just as I believe we can save the planet we just pick up the fucking plastic and do something new I mean it, it's just to do it and even in this context of growing up in in institutions ourselves we can become great parents and and uh, find ways that are outside that big mainstream matrix thing that we are being pushed it's just a question of being conscious and being ready to work for it also with our own emotions when it's sometimes confronting and we have to think about where we come from and what what trauma in our own life maybe is interfering with the way that we can parent I mean we are talking about it we have this podcast but there are actually quite a lot of blogs and books and and podcasts out there now people talking about how can we live a life that is more fulfilling that is more free, that is more alive, that is more biologically natural. It It's a movement and, and it doesn't take the whole world to change the world. It, it takes some dedicated people. So yeah, I, I have a lot of hope, obviously. Otherwise, you know. <laughs> so if the theme today is if you if you believe in attachment parenting and you start doing attachment parenting, you might become an unschooler ten years later. Oh gosh, There's that's a risk there. A gateway. Yeah. It's a, a real risk. It's a risky move. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because you can't. I just think it's impossible to be respectful of our children, listen to what they're saying. And really feel into our role as their biggest supporters and facilitators to then get to two and a half years and go, oh, what are what's a good nursery around here? How do I go about socialising my child for two days a week? But those two ideas are so incongruent. Um, and, and, yet, I guess- and, and yet it's what happens a lot, isn't it? Yeah, oh, 100%, actually, because I think actually the conversation that Luna and I were having the other day was because like every every day when I'm on social media in various groups that I'm involved in, I see that question 
oh, my child's two and a half. Something about two and a half is like they get to two. So parents know what to do until their child's two. And I don't know whether this is a cultural thing because I'm in England now and it seems very, very common to send a two-year-old to nursery. I don't know what it is about two. In Australia, it tends to be more kindergarten at four. So maybe all countries are slightly varied, but parents know how to raise their child till two. And then they're like, oh, now I'm not really sure what to do. I'm, I might need to consult an educational expert by way of a nursery or a preschool program. L literally, this is daily that I see this stuff. And, and also, and so do you see the question, what is a good attachment kindergarten around here? <laughs> I've seen that question. Yeah. Do you see it? Is it still, I'm not that much on social media at the moment. So I well, they might it call it in early. In early learning circles, they call it Montessori or Steiner. <laughs> but well, what they mean, they they are sort of they they kind of like oh we've just been playing at home for a couple of years and now we're not sure what to do next. We we have a feeling that they still need to be playing, but we don't want to take care of that ourselves. So we'll put them in a Steiner kindergarten or a Steiner nursery. Yeah, I did that. <clears throat> then I got smarter. I mean, we we've all we've all done stuff. We've all had the pancake child, <laughs> the pancake child. Well, the first pancake. Actually, child. we had a great. So, as I had cancer, I'm actually grateful that I had my kids in a great place because my husband had a severe personal crisis when I was about to die, and uh, it was very nice that there were other people around to look after my kids at that time in our life. So. The real reality for us is that we don't regret it because it saved us in a very crucial moment in our life. But we had a there was a great leader in the Steiner kindergarten where my two middle children spent some of their childhood. And she actually told us, you know, when the kid is here for more than five hours a day, it's my child. It was such a provocative statement that I got pissed and then I got angry and then I got more pissed. And then I felt frustrated and then I felt sad. And then I realized she was right. And I started picking up the children after three hours every day because, <laughs> yeah, uh, that was as far as I could like kind of push my mindset at the moment. At least she was honest about it. And I'm thankful for that because that was also the reason we took them out as soon as I had um no more chemotherapy and blood transfusions. It helped me a lot that an honest person working with children could tell me that. And I think there is a lot of denial going on, actually, that Parents think that they are good, doing a good job when they send their kids to kindergarten. They think it's a good thing that there are professionals around the children, that that it's needed, that you need an education to be able to give them the right stimuli and, and, and this whole story that we need professionals and and that will be I mean if I if I had if God forbid it, but if I ever had cancer again, I would like a professional doctor to help me. I get that. But with children, the misconception is that we need professionals to help them grow, that if we put professionals around them, it will be better. I'm totally sure that a professional doctor can help me with my disease if I have one better than the next person down the street. But because we're not aligned in our society with exactly the attachment concept then there is this false idea of professionalism that we are making the world a better place by putting professionals around children that they will learn more that they will be better socialized that they will have more um, age um, age perfect fun because they have the right toys in the kindergarten whatever but as the most important thing in childhood is the base, the, the, the rock that, that development stands on is attachment. Then if you break that attachment every morning, 
and try to sort of mend it in the afternoon while you also do the yoga and do the laundry and do the dishes and do the cooking and make sure you have a shower and, and have a fight with your husband or whatever is going on those three four five hours of family time in the afternoon then it's very very broken after 10 years and 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 you can you can add a lot of math into that brain but you will have a broken person and and a broken person is not what we need the person doesn't need it to live a life on the base of being broken but also as a society we don't need broken people to run around try to help other broken people as as with all the challenges that we could argue that we have as humankind we need powerful people and powerful people need to stand on a rock, not in the mud. So is there anything more important right now? I feel very, <clears throat> how do we get it out there <laughs> that the importance of, of having strong personalities? I, I see at least in the Hispanic community, a lot of contradictions this is why I asked the first question between attachment and the respectful parenting because of, I think it's also because of all this, what you just mentioned, Cecil, about the experts, because they make rules. <laughs> like what is uh, wrong and what is right and what you have to do. Um, in my case, uh, when I become a mother, I was quite like empowered and sure about my instincts and I read I think only one book but yeah but they, they, when they were little but now it's like I only see people saying what is right and then it's like if you have if the kids have to play outside because it's good for them uh, but then if they don't want, but it's like, I, I always listen this speech about the respect, but it's not actually about them, the kids. It's more about what it's good for, I don't know, the, your body, your mind, or the, the planet, you know, and everything gets in there, but then no one is listening to the kid. And the kids want to be inside, drawing or watching a movie I don't know but then you just lost the attachment part you are in this respect something whatever is someone saying the kids have to do at this age this is what I feel right now what I heard or what I listen to people and I I I think it's 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 not close to attachment it's more on ideas on on the parents because they are reading these books with this rule that they are maybe far from their own connection or aligned with their what they feel their instinct the biology <laughs> way yeah that's what I feel so I uh, I actually cannot listen long to what I see on media because it's like Ugh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it's very hard and, and this is why there is resistance to it. It's actually not easy. Well, I don't find it easy to be respectful when our children want to do something that we don't want them to do. So respectful parenting, most of the time, most of the kind of modern popular work on what we might call respect, respectful parenting or aware parenting or natural parenting or conscious parenting, it still, it still remains that the parent sets the agenda. They just use a sing-song voice or a happy song or getting down to the child's level to coerce their child into doing what they want. And that's not respectful. That's not respectful. Um, and, of course, yeah, someone will always say, well, oh, sometimes the kids have to listen to the parents, blah, 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 whatever. Yes, that could be true if they're about to run across the road. But respect respecting our children really means honouring their desires and working with them and not coercing them to do what we want. So I guess that next level where where, attach, where the idea of attachment then becomes self-directed learning or unschooling is really about us digging more deeply into 
how we can work with our child, how we can facilitate their desires and their path and not defaulting to our agenda, which is often based on a lot of programming and a lot of external ideas that have been given to us but are not from us, et cetera. So I'm, I'm just thinking something that I want to say before I forget it because and it's kind of combining what you two just said or springing from there. I think that the thing about attachment and why it's biologically the sort of uh, natural thing to do is because it would be important for the infant and the small kids to be uh, very securely attached to the um, grown-ups uh, who sort of know about the world, who can protect them, who can guide them, all that. And so that if you're not securely attached to them, it becomes more uh, dangerous for a child to, to be in the world, right? So the thing is, uh, why is it important that there's a secure attachment? And this leads to the misunderstanding or the, or the, the discrepancy or whatever it's called between uh um authoritarian and authoritative i think those are the two it's like because that's all about the respect so i i'm i'm getting a bit muddy here i hope it's going to be okay. clear but mm. the the thing is um why do we also want our kids to be attached to us because when a kid is securely attached to you they naturally want to follow your advice they naturally want to listen to you maybe not follow your advice but they they naturally want to listen to you and follow you and learn from you and that is and i think that's interesting with the unschooling um movement too is that it is actually our role as parents to kind of show away and be the guide because we have been here longer and we happen to know that you shouldn't drink that because it's poison or you shouldn't go there because there's a big hole and you're going to fall in it like we can show our children the ins and outs a bit of the world and and especially when they're really small they do need us a lot to show them and tell them a lot of things and then then the problem then comes when they become bigger and we need to let go of that. And that's where the whole, uh, um, all of the difficulties start there. Uh, and I think you were saying before, Sarah, about what is it with two and a half years old? Well, there's something about two years old that's called the terrible twos, right? So something happens. <laughs> so can I just say, I've never had a kid that was terrible at two. I've had all of my kids who have been two years old, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they've been like you are when you're two years old. But, and I'm really getting like, it's. I can hear that it's going in all sorts of directions now, but is anyone getting where I'm sort yes. of getting? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're, ta you're talking yeah. about the yeah. foundations. You're literally talking yeah. about those foundations. I, I think it's just because the whole, like I see it a lot, like in my work with parents, there's a lot of, yeah, I want to respect them. I want to give them freedom. I know that's the right thing to do, but geez, I, they, there has to be some limits, right? And I have to guide them and I have to this and I have to that. Yeah, that's what's, it's really quite simple, but not easy. That's not the same thing. But when we get into the heart of it, parenting really is quite simple, honestly, but it's not easy. But that's because we complicate it in a lot of ways. I think there's a lot of overthinking going on. And I know someone who has a really great quote that she quite often will say, one of her daughters often says, it's not that deep, mom. <laughs> Can you guess who that is? <laughs> but it's like, I do think, I do think that's a lot because a lot of times, and then I'll just pass the talking stick to someone, but I feel like, like a lot of times, like people will be like, oh, but it seems like, oh, oh, what, oh like, like, why aren't you worried about this? Or how can you be uh, not doing it on, I, I like, why do, why do you seem like it's so easy or simple? And I'll, quite a lot of times, it's like, well, it's it's not it's not always easy, but it does get easier with time. And it 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 really is quite simple in the in the heart of it. And I think because I've learned over years to stop to fucking overthink so much. Sorry, my French. 
But I used to overthink a lot and try to find that right way of doing things, doing the right thing, following the rules of this or that, and like being because I wanted my kids to have all the things I didn't have, and I wanted to be the mom that I didn't have, and I wanted to be that good, perfect mom that I thought you know my kids needed and I should be. And I've just sort of I really feel inside of myself that simplifying things and stopping to like overthink so much that actually helps a lot and that makes it a lot easier to be cool and chill and not turn so many things into conflicts for instance and when you don't turn things into conflicts well then being respectful is quite easy because I don't need to impose my will on my child all the time so yeah I, I've gone from like saying no 100 times to saying no 50 times to saying no 10 times to hardly ever saying no now unless it's really really important or really really bothering for me or whatever like some but it's just and it's just all that's just all connected and it all comes back I think to the attachment in the beginning if that makes sense it makes a lot of sense. The talking stick now and say something that's actually like coherent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Luna, we like it when you talk. <laughs> and I think we all, when we talk, we have something we want to say. And then we sort of, it it sort of moves to the next thing and then it becomes a little blurry, but then there's something great. And it, <laughs> that's just how it goes. It's all right. I, I think <laughs> it's it's important stuff. The and, and a very important thing is when we discuss attachment parenting is, it sounds can sound very soft and um psychology like and 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 uh, you know if you're this kind of guy who gets up at five and do a hundred push-ups and 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 run to work to make a hundred thousand million dollars a day or whatever is important for you this sounds like you know bullshit but the thing is it's not just about feeling good. It's not just about some weird thing I can say about standing on a rock when you do your development as a human being. It's also basic safety. It's it's and and this thing with the respect and the trust that if you grow up in a context where your parents actually have your back and that's your your baseline, that's your experience every time you felt some discomfort when you were an infant someone saw it and fixed it and when you were three and you couldn't stand within stay within yourself because everything was changing in your mind then someone had you and helped you through that phase of life and maybe also when you were 15 and things got really weird because now it's all crazy then someone also had you and got you and was there for you then then you grow up with with a deep trust that the people who are closest to you are worth listening to, mm. then you will stop. I remember when my first child was a year and a half, maybe two, we lived in, in the center of Copenhagen and we would walk in the streets, obviously. And uh, she just ran in the street. I didn't hold her hand. She was not in a stroller. I obviously didn't have her on a lead. I've seen that in reality, in the real world. I thought, <laughs> I mean, I almost fainted but this exists. Um, and I was being sometimes shouted at by people. I was a young mother. I, I, I don't think I was very young, but you know, in the context of this world, I was 23 at that point, maybe 25. And I was shouted at for being irresponsible and, and get hold of that child. But she would always stop when we, when there was a road, always. And if there was something she didn't see, some danger, I'd just say stop. And she'd stop immediately. And it was not about me controlling her. We would just, I mean, it's not, my mothering has, has never really been a project. This whole talking about it came from my shock when I realized what mainstream mothering is, because I think it's crazy. And, and I had to explain myself all the time to people when they didn't understand the way we were living. So I started blogging and now I, I've progressed to this podcasting because I, I totally don't understand why you would put a child in, in a dark room all by itself to cry itself to sleep. It, it's, I mean, I find it local. I find it, I mean, who can even come up with that idea? 
can, I, can I just can I just ask you something about what you just said? Like I'm just gonna venture a guess because you said, oh, she just ran in the street, and when I would say stop, she would stop. So yep. can I just assume, and you can tell me if I'm correct, you probably weren't always stopping her from doing lots of things when she didn't need to be stopped. No. Right. No. So but obviously a two year old in a street in a big city where no, there what, are cars. Yeah. My you point know, is, my point is, if you don't do that all the time, if you're not stopping the child all the time for all sorts of weird reasons, because oh, I don't know, there might be too many toys on the floor if I don't stop you from taking out any more now, or or there might be, I like whatever, like all these things. When we, yeah, so yeah, that kind of, like my my point is that that's it. It ties into attachment because you don't want to be attached to a person. And it ties into what you said about having children's backs. You don't you don't want to be attached to a person who you feel is limiting you, who you feel is preventing you from living, learning, growing, exploring this world that you're in. So you 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 as the child, you want to have a parent that you feel, oh my God, they have my back. They're helping me explore the world. They're helping me grow and learn. So they might not process the thoughts in that way, but but you also want to have a parent, and we've talked about that, Sarah, a lot. That's the ideal of attachment is you want to have a parent that you know she's right here. She's right here. I can come back anytime I want. I can run back, be held, be in the safe you know, arms. And then when I've had enough of that, I can go out again. And I can go a little further and then a little further and come back. And, and that's the, the natural back and forth. And I think that's, that's the attachment. But we in our society get some sort of mix up that we think that we think parenting is about controlling and 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 micromanaging to and we've talked about that too before to ensure some kind of outcome in the end but that's that's not attachment that's that's I don't know well it's, it's that's another, a project know, like, management sort of, yeah well anyway I didn't want to like in like hijack your thing yeah. no 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 I'm it's, good it's a super I good think point it's, that it's relevant mm. what you're it's saying. so so super nuanced because I I have a story that uh, about a child running up to the edge of the road and stopping and never ever holding my hand uh that are similarly themed to yours Cecilia but it's my fourth child and I on the basis of my previous children particularly my third I started to develop this belief around attachment that that meant that a good attachment naturally meant my children were going to want to do what I said <laughs> because sometimes when you read the books that's what it makes you think and then my fourth child was born well you guys have all met my fourth child I mean she does not care she does not she does what she she's going to do what she's going to do and I just have to trust that she gets to the edge of the road and stops, right? What would also happen often is that the traffic would stop because they wouldn't realise that she actually knew at two years old how to cross the road. Now, I didn't say to my two-year-old, oh, run up ahead and cross the road by yourself. Of course not. But I had three other children and two dogs and a pusher and I was carrying scooters and a picnic basket on my head. I didn't even have a hand free, let alone she did not hold my hand. She would never hold my hand. I don't think she held my hand until she was about seven. Uh, and she, but she had always been with us, always been with us. When she was a baby, she was on me because I didn't have any extra hands free. And then when she was a toddler, she was next to us and she was with her siblings. And then by the time she was walking on her own, she'd been watching everybody else cross the road. And she knew that you got to the edge of the road and then you would stop. And then I can still see her little blonde wavy hair, messy blonde hair. And she got, she'd look both ways super quick. I don't know what she saw, but enough to cross the road. And But sometimes people would stop. And like you said, Cecile, I would have people shout at me. Uh, my kids would be scooting along the street ahead, obviously, because they were on a scooter. Arthur would have his no, no shoes on and his blonde hair flowing. And I had people slow down and shout out of their window at me because my children were like navigating the streets by them. I mean, I was with, but I was with them. I was with them and they learned from being with me 
Mm-hmm. I assume, I mean, they would have seen me get to the edge of the road and check to see if there's any cars coming. And so they gradually learned. And it didn't look how I thought because, honestly, I did expect that because I, like, slept with my children and held them for 26 hours a day and breastfed till they were 10 and gave them organic homemade food, that they would naturally go on to do exactly what I said. And that is not my experience, but... <laughs> But what they what they tell me sometimes actually tell me, and and I have asked my oldest about this, is that they want to know what I think. Exactly. They might not do what I think they should do. Yes. They might have a different idea. They might go, oh yeah, no, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do that. But they want to know yes. what we think. They yeah. want to know what we think. So yeah. then they can sort out all the information because they've got other influences, of course. But we are their we are their biggest influence, even if they make their own independent choice. Because I don't actually want little robots, fuel, um, but they want to know what we think. And, and I that's reckon attachment ties into unschooling. That's yes. where the respectful yes. part comes in. Yes. yes, they value your advice. Yes, they value it. Because yes. and but you you don't value advice like I didn't value my mom's advice ever. I would never ask her advice. And not today, <laughs> it's changed. But when yeah. I was a kid and a teen, because what did I get? I got told off. I got um uh you know scoffs and poo and who do I think I am and what's in my little head of the little head of mine and <laughs> that that's whole like that's the kind of like. Oh, you know, punishments, or she would set a limit. If I told her something I wanted to do, then she'd prevent me from doing it, probably for all the right reasons from her perspective. But the point is just that that was not creating any attachment. That was just creating more division. And I was just pulling more away. And I couldn't care less. Whereas if my dad would say something, because he never said anything. I mean, <laughs> unless I asked him his, his opinion, he'd give it to me. And he wouldn't always be like, or like singy songy that that's not the thing but the point is he he wasn't trying to micromanage me so I've always valued his opinion and his advice because I felt like it was being provided in a respectful way and yeah so but but it's it's just super important because that's the that's the 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 real one of the main issues with all of this is that we that thing exactly yeah oh but if i do this and if i'm just being respectful of that then my kids will do what i say whoa hang on that's not the point of unschooling that's not that's the wrong paradigm that's not what you want you don't want them to do what you say <laughs> but, but there's something sorry go on yeah no no go on there's just something wrong with that idea in general that yeah. is this the goal of of having children to make them do what we say I, 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 there's something I, I, wrong with the whole idea of that yeah. because what what I, I mean everyone if they back up a little bit and think about their life and and think about okay I found this great guy or girl and I'm going to make a family I, I, I will have some offspring and this will probably be a major part of my life uh why, why am I doing this and what do I want for these children that I'm making with this person I hopefully like um is obedience the goal really? It, it probably isn't. It's just the thing that everyone talks about that, oh, it's so annoying. My kids never do what I say. And my teens, oh my God, they're always messy and they never tell do what I'm they're told, whatever. It's 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 this there's this humming of of do what you're told thing going on in the in the whole conversation, the big conversation about children. So it becomes like, oh, that's the main theme. But I mean, back it up a little bit. Think about it. Is that what you want for your children? No. You want your children to feel good inside. You want your children to be motivated. You want them to jump out of bed in the morning, whatever time of day that is, happy, beginning their day, doing things they want to do. You want them to make friends, find love, be able to support themselves in life, maybe go traveling, maybe not, um, find some joy and, and some meaningfulness in this life. You don't want them to obey, actually. Wait, I, I never talk to anyone who actually wants it when I talk to them. It's just this, I don't know, weird, weird common sense box that we have to get rid of. 
it's it's not the point of parenting. It's not the point of having children. It's not the point of growing up. There is a lot of developmental things going on in childhood, a lot. There is a big difference between an infant and a, let's say 20 year old. And all of that construction of the human being, it's our job to support it, to make sure there is a safe base, a cliff where they can put their feet and stand while this amazing thing is going on. Remember remember when your kids took their first steps and they started walking? It's like a miracle. And, and that's just one little tiny thing. I mean, now they speak several languages and they I, I can't even start. So this, do they do what I tell them? My kids do what I tell them if I say this is about health and safety. This is our like, we have this headline, health and safety. If someone says health and safety, everybody pays attention. Okay, that is poisonous. That is dangerous. But I'm not telling, I'm not ever telling them what to do if it's not about health and safety. Then we're having conversations about how complicated life is and and, and what options we have and what makes us happy. And I'm just so grateful that I'm the one they're asking. I don't want them to do exactly what I'm what my first idea would be. But I'm very happy they play ball with me and my husband and each other, by the way. Um, but but which all comes down to the attachment again, because they are securely attached to you. Just as you're probably securely attached to Jesper, I would suppose, and the other way around. I mean, he's not too I mean, annoying. <laughs> no, but I mean, you trust him. He yeah. trusts you. Right. That's it, it. I think attachment is also about trust. It's about trust. And actually, probably that role. No, I think trust is a derivative of attachment, actually. Attachment is the establishment of a relation where if yeah. I express a need, you're going to help me. And I can yeah. I know that. Yeah, you can say that is trust. Attachment but, but is it, trust it's, it, isn't it like the hen and the egg? Because yeah, when is. the infant is there and cries and you respond. Oh, you're just gonna teach them that they cannot that you'll always be there. Uh well, yeah. 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 <laughs> Good. And that's kind of the point. So they learn, oh, I she's what you said before, she's got my back. Oh, he's got my back. I can trust them, they're there. So the trust is building and the attachment is building, and it's kind of interchangeable and into like it, it has an interaction. <clears throat> but it but it I but I really think that's that's just so important and 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 why it ties in together. It, because it's all about attachment, really. It really yeah. is. All all human relations are. Like we wouldn't be sitting here today having this chat if we weren't kind of in some way attached to each other because we kind of think that we'll all say reasonably coherent things and sometimes we won't. But I mean, we do have this like idea <laughs> of, you know, so it, it, every relationship is like that, right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so, so um, you know, I think Cecile mentioned this before early on about really I think attachment being about survival. Like we, we are part of the animal world and when you observe, <clears throat> um, I don't know, you guys may have seen uh, chickens hatch underneath their mum, right, for example. Uh, it's absolutely amazing to watch a hen hatch her chicks, right, and initially, you don't see those chicks. They are underneath their mum. And you can hear. You can hear them, right? And they talk to each other. The mum and the chicks are talking to each other all the time. And she's sticking her head underneath. So the mother, actually, if you've seen a hen sitting on eggs and then on her chicks, the body, her body will, like, flatten to spread over the eggs. And then it adjusts a bit as, and, and by the way, they turn the eggs underneath them every day to keep the um, incubation like even, right, for 21 days. Then they start to hatch and her body shifts a little bit and then because they're alive under her and they've got to, you know, breathe and whatever. And then after like a day or so, maybe the chicks will poke their heads out and then they start coming out but they stay really close. And then after a couple of days, uh, you know, 24 hours or so, they're dry because they've stayed under their mum so their feathers have dried. And then after a week, they their feathers start to change. They start to get their, like, wing feathers. And then the mum will be, like, pecking 
in the yard and the chicks will start copying the mum pecking and then she'll show them how to like dust bathe and then the chicks will dust bathe and and there's that's how they're surviving she's literally showing them how to be an adult chicken and they are staying close to her because there's crows flying over and so sometimes in the yard you would see her putting her wings up and the chicks un are under the wings but they're still kind of walking around she's like literally covering them from predators and that is like a human baby like making a noise crying whatever to say to the mum oh I need something and then we you know are by our biology like in constant contact with our baby while they're gradually learning how to see properly and move and reach for things and then they go on the floor for a bit and then they maybe have a cry because they want to come back you know and that goes on for years and years but it's about it's about surviving like this is how our children learn how to be thriving grown-ups by you know that close physical connection in the early days and then you know Luna was talking about the, that tether you know moving away coming back moving away coming back for like years probably like maybe forever you know um knowing that you've got that solid base and I wanted to say too because I I remember when I because I know this can be painful for people too when I realized that I'd made some mistakes with my first child um I definitely went through this stage of grieving like oh I've stuffed up I've stuffed up and can I ever fix it? What have I done? And then, of course, it brings up our own attachment wounds. Oh, my! what about what my mum did when I was a baby? Like, oh, my God, I've missed something. She missed something. Her mum missed something and so on. And it's like such an overwhelmingly painful feeling. And, and maybe for a bit you do think, oh, I can never, I can never fix that. How can I go back? How can I go back to a newborn baby and, and make sure she's with me all the time, not in a different room, not whatever, you know, and, and many of us have these have these stories. I was like late to the party to understanding what instinctive mothering was all about. Um, so, yeah, I had some work to do. Um, and and so I want to give comfort too to, to mothers and fathers who like listen to this and go, Oh my God, what did like, because I, I get messages from people all the time saying like, I didn't know. I didn't know. What can I do? Um, and so you can fall into this hole of being so overwhelmed by that, that you think you might never be able to repair that uh, or fix that. And I can't remember what I started out saying. Well, then I'll say something if I may. Yeah. Stop we me. Sometimes. <laughs> well, so. We sometimes say in our family, uh, it's never too late to have a good childhood. And uh, I felt the pain as well. I was by no means a perfect mother with my first or second or third. And I'm not a perfect mother with my fourth child either. I'm just doing my best. And uh, it feels like running alongside a train that's going really fast. And, and at the moment, it feels like running alongside four trains going in each direction really fast. And I don't really know how to learn all the things I need to learn fast enough. So all I can do is to try to meditate two minutes a day and be honest about the situation. At least I can talk to the kids. It's never too late to have a good childhood. And I think if you wake up to realizing you personally have attachment wounds and your kids probably have them too, it's just a question of, talking to them if they're old enough to understand the concepts or and not or and do something about it and this is actually a topic I would like to make sure we touch upon because we've talked a lot about infants and it makes some sort of instinctive sense to most people that obviously babies shouldn't cry and obviously you change the diaper the second you realize it needs to be changed in case you use diapers maybe you should learn not to but that's another story you give them food, you make sure they're not too hot, and not too cold. With the small ones, it seems reasonable, right? But what about a 15-year-old who's in a sort of grumpy mood and um, you see the mother cooking five different meals because the kid is not really eating 
but really hungry, but also really nauseous, but also really annoyed and also really annoying. And uh, then they, the mother, she will uh, wash the clothes and, and open the window of the room, maybe organize the room if the, cat, if the kid has a room. And uh, the mother might uh, buy a book or give up her work for the afternoon and ask if the kid wants to go to watch a movie or whatever. And and I think a lot of social judgment of this situation would be that mother is just being the servant. That mother, that's crazy. This Catering is to their every whim. Exactly. And what was the word we use in Denmark with that sport, with that stone thing they push over the ice? Curling. Yeah. So Curling parents. <laughs> but the thing is, in my <laughs> observation, teenagers very much need sometimes just as much attention and just as much nursing as newborn babies not all the time we do get our sleep at this moment most of the days and i mean it changes but if you wake up to the music and your child let's say 12 and you never did attachment parenting and you realize you did a lot of mistakes and they've been to nursery and they've had babysitters and maybe they cried themselves to sleep because by accident you read that book and I mean you could have done a lot of mistakes but there's no reason not to start today and just do the things do the things meet the needs of the child and and maybe if it's a 12 year old talk to the child it doesn't have to be therapy but just talk about it like I think I've done some things wrong and I think we should try to work in a different way now yeah I'll shut up Kali yeah uh, now that you say you speak about talk to them i i was thinking about these things like i there is something i also see in parents and in people adults in general that they it's difficult to to have or sustain conversations that you don't like and I think this is very important in unschooling and in attachment uh, to have this conversation. Like, okay, because we talk already about they don't do what I want them to do. So we talk about that because then I say, no, oh, no, I don't want you to do this right now. I don't know, whatever. And so they, why not? And it's like, well, many times, uh, sometimes I have to say, I don't really know. It's like something doesn't don't something move here. And it's like, and I have this conversation maybe two times with my son. Like, it's like I don't have really a reason I can't explain, but I don't feel good. So then we talk about that. Mm -hmm. So it's like sometimes we don't we don't really know, and so we have to like you know uh, do this with the idea um and find what is it what what i'm saying no but then in in this case we talk and and he always because he has this secure space when he knows he can express and ask things so he always say like what is uh what's gonna happen to me why are you saying it's dangerous for example mm -hmm. and that, because uh, it can I don't know I don't I don't have a, um, a thing here but but this conversation had happened and what I found is like um, people is not uh, I think it's something you have to work in your family and with to be uh, to be able to have these conversations when you think one thing and the other person think another thing what are we gonna do that's the I, I always talk about my family as a team or community or whatever. If you have to live together, we need to find uh, the point. If I don't like this and you want to do or, or the other way around, maybe they say, now I need this space, but I also need this space or I don't know. So I find that in the end, the adult, the adult think they have, I don't know, the power or more importance in in your words to say what I say it's have more more value so this is I think something uh, 
it's an idea I think everybody can see and understand because it happened all the time. The kid wants something and I say no. And I was the this kid saying, why not? Why not? All the time. <laughs> and my mother always answered like, she did, she's not the one who gives reasons. It's just because I say it, but my father always talk and talk. And because of blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So then we have conversations. So it's what I see super important in the family and in attachment. Uh, it can be uncomfortable. Yes, but I think it's the place you have to push to be there in this uncomfortable conversation. Maybe there are uh, silly things, like normal things in the house. But yes, stop and talk about these things. Yes, that's what I have to say. And I don't also, have seen it, but, but no, they have, well, I think, a pretty and and yeah, whatever. Yes. I think also <laughs> very beautiful about what you say is that a no is up for discussion in in a family with strong attachment and good good healthy attachment and and uh, therefore respect that if you say no and and someone asks you about that no then it might be yes i i've been down many rabbit holes of my own nose um why am i saying no to this really and sometimes it the end of the story is really i can't have it i'm sorry i'm doing my best i'm stretching on every angle that can be stretched of my personality my personal history my value system everything but that is one step too far i can't have it and then as you say we live together we're family we all have to be in this space uh, and and because there is this basic respect from for each other we will also back off if if one person in our family says i can't have that i simply this is more than i can take i might be able to work with it but today it's a no it could be one of my children saying i can't do that or it could be my husband it could be me but i like the way that a no can be up for discussion and that's actually another thing that is part of the mainstream uh parenting regime that you know you have to stick with your you know if you said no then it's no if you said yes then it's yes if you made a rule you have to make sure that that rule always applies and and that's just another bullshit thing if your daughter always says it's not that deep mom then my uh, oldest son, he always says, seems like it's complicated. <laughs> and both are true. <laughs> yeah. Might not be deep, but there are many factors to, and sometimes it's just complicated. You can't say this is how the world works. It it works with, and then sometimes, and then there could be this element and rules um, never really apply. And, you know, in, in my house even if I think it's no but my song thing is yes the conversation won't be finished yeah you know it's like because you said like sometimes it's just not because I cannot stand it no it doesn't matter here I mean for myself it's yes even if I cannot understand it so it's like the, the I always say okay Maybe it's late or whatever, say, we have to continue the conversation tomorrow. I mean, it's like, but it's not end. It's not ended, the conversation. Till, I don't know, some of but us yes. uh, give, <laughs> maybe, or something in between. I don't know. Yeah. So but that's also because... what's going on in my family, that when I say okay, okay. sometimes it stops with the no, I can't have it. It always stops with the, no, I can't have it. I'm willing to work on it. I'm willing to find out why it is, but please don't do it today. Okay. Can we get, can you, we give me some space? And because they know that I'm doing my ultimate best to give them all the space that I can ever imagine giving them, they also respect, they don't want to violate me so that I am afraid or sad or or feel huge personal discomfort. Obviously, I mean, they they like me, I think, I know. 
and and yeah. and they don't want me to suffer and i'm not saying this i will suffer if you do it if it's not the truth i'm not using it as a tool to control them it's just sometimes really the truth that this thing i can't have it give me two weeks i'll work on it and and it's been very interesting journeys i've worked on a lot of things i never even imagined would be a problem for me and and i've overcome weird things it, it's been fun and i think it's very beautiful this and it's also come of course to attachment like even if they is a yes for them or for my song for example and and you say like i need to think more they they wait because in the end, we all want to get on well and we want the other to be fine. So I think that is the important thing. So this is a real value in the family as an, and in the unschooling mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, so conversations and the no may be a yes and the yes may be a no. And... Often we say in the unschooling community that unschooling is really just about talking <laughs> because that's what's going on yeah. in the unschooling family. We talk a lot, uh, like as in many hours every day we talk uh, with uh, the ch kids that we have and the spouse that we might have. And and in the, if we have multiple children, there are many constellations of conversations that could go on and Talking really is the backbone of of the unschooling life, I think, uh, compared yeah. to the mainstream life. We, we we have a lot of time talking to our children, and it's it's the most important element. I, th I so think then that's... here I find oh, sorry, sorry. Be because I, sorry, I I find also here I'll, uh, another contradiction because of the rules and the right way of doing things because there is no right way i mean after we have say all this maybe someone says your, your kid or you should act this way but there is no because you don't know how your kid is maybe your kid is completely different so it it, it it won't work for you what this person is saying so i think it's always like uh to an attitude to being open and listen and maybe you are going to do the completely opposite of what they are saying in this book. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and you don't have to talk to your child for three hours a day to be a good on school mom. It's not a rule. What I'm saying is just it comes up very often that no, please, <laughs> that it's the reality that that unschooling families do talk a lot. But maybe not all of them. Mm -hmm. It's not it's yeah, not sorry. a rule. And I think this thing about rules is that no, it's not rules, but it's more like natural consequences or things that just outcomes that happens. It it it's something that just comes with the thing, just as on on the unschooling way of life is a natural sort of extension, like we started out by saying to the attachment parenting uh way of doing things. It's it's so and that but but then and then because it's so natural it ends up being that way in most most unschooling families it ends up being that way so it comes to look like a rule i mean it it looks like oh that's some no it's not because you have to do it but it's probably what you're going to do because it's going to naturally evolve that way cuz also like there's a lot of people who come to unschooling from homeschooling they'll they'll start by pulling their kids out of school or, or not putting them there in the first place, but they'll start out with like doing more structured homeschooling and stuff. And then gradually they sort of move towards a more free approach and more unschooling because they realize, I guess, a lot of times with the, you know, being at home and not having the, that very uh, rigid scaffolding that you have in the school system because you don't have it you sort of realize a lot of things that, I don't know, maybe by accident, oh, we didn't get to do our maths at nine o'clock this morning. And then you discover that, oh, it wasn't actually a problem because whatever. And then, oh, maybe it doesn't matter if we can just jump it tomorrow too or do it at five o'clock instead. And then you gradually just move towards, oh, sheesh, we haven't actually done math for like a week. Oh, 
well, we're still alive and well. I don't know this. I I don't know because I I haven't done that. I didn't. I I came directly into unschooling, so I don't exactly know how it happens. But but I hear people say a lot. Oh, we started out more structured. We started out like this, and then we now we're just full blown unschoolers. So I guess there's like a yeah. I don't know what I want to about that, but yeah. So just to like, I feel I feel like that's pretty close to to like tying it up in some way, Luna, because you're actually starting to talk about self-directed living, self-directed education and trusting self because to direct your own life, to direct your own learning, you essentially are motivated by that connection to self. And the very early stages or where that's like planted is in those early days of attachment. Um, and it's just such a, it's just such a, um, it's not coming full circle. How's a, like, like what, what we are showing a newborn by listening to them and tending to their needs through instinct, right? Let's just pretend that we all got that right from the word go for a second. Um, so we are validating their communication and their needs and their desire for connection with that close contact and being responsive. And then we are actually, you know, imprinting on them and vice versa. And they are gradually as they 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 move away because they said something and were responded to that they can listen to themselves and trust themselves. And then actually can can take agency over their own education and over over time and years their own life so to me it seems like if we're talking about our purpose as humans and how we should best thrive this is a a, a beautiful like organic like it's not that it's probably more like that but mm-hmm. you know there's that that thread from birth or something there is also this bump that we might we haven't talked a lot about but if the attachment when it goes wrong we all did our mistakes and we all lived through mistakes done by our parents what happens is you express a need or a discomfort it's not being met uh worst case scenario is the kindergarten there is no one to meet the need because they're too busy and they're by the way not your parents so you're expressing a need to no one or it's not being met and then the next step is not to come back to a feeling of feeling good in life because the need has not even been heard maybe and that creates a lot of base emotion of fear of of insecurity, of anger, maybe, of, well, you just list all the negative emotions and you start living your life in them. And and also the sense of self, which happens, it grows from, well, from inside the womb and, and throughout life. But first year is more crucial than later. The sense of being here on the planet, the sense of having a, a, a person being someone here in this life, it becomes associated with discomfort and and these negative emotions. So later on, it becomes harder to go there, to find out, go into, this is me, this is my being, this is where I am, how I am, and therefore also what I want and what makes me happy and what is maybe my path, mission, what I want to do, what I can be excited, passionate and, and emotional about doing. It's a hard place to go if it's a hurt place. And then you come to a point where it's actually nice that someone gives you a math book and tells you, you know, the answers are in the back, but don't look and, and fill it out within three months. And then you're good because you don't know what good is. This is the downside of not doing the attachment this is the the hard part and this is probably also the reason that parents want rules they read books with rules they want to know what to do because they don't know what to do because knowing what to do 
it claims the rock of knowing who you are and knowing who you are. Well, then you'd need to go inside and that's not nice. And I've actually never been in there. Did anyone ever open that door? It, it's it's complicated and it's painful. And I respect that. I understand that that even those who, who who turn a blind eye to these things, they do it because they want to do their best. And 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 their best is to to try to find a good system and stick to it because that's what's been working. That's what's been working throughout school and high school and university. And now we have a job and I do what my boss tells me and I'm getting the salary. It's working. I understand that this whole controlled way of living comes from attachment wounds and, and they are hard to heal when you're an adult, especially if you don't work on it. So where, where did I even come from? I don't know where you came from, but I, I um, it makes me want to go somewhere just quickly Great. because what you said before about it's never too late to have a good childhood, and like I feel like I'm having a good childhood now. I actually appreciate going to my parents. I want to go there. I like to go there. I actually have like a loving, harmonious relationship. I like my mom. <laughs> like, yeah, I've always course. loved her, but I also like her. I mm -hmm. did not like my mom as a kid and a, as a, especially a teen because there was a lot of it. Like, I, it's, I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't want to, like, you know, be. No, no. She's, no. she's, she's her own person. And I, it's like, I also don't have the need to really, like, do anything like, and, 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 and tell a lot and blah, blah, blah. But suffice it to say that there was a lot of things and I did not like my mom as a kid. Um, now I do. But, but the point is, what has been tremendously healing for me has been precisely to parent in the way that I wasn't parent to parent it, to give my children what I didn't get and to be the mom that I needed and wanted and longed for and all the things that I like, all the needs <laughs> when I wasn't met in my needs and, and heard and seen and understood and all that, you know, but to give that, and I've messed up a lot. And every time my kids would trigger me, that is because that sent me back to the little kid that I was, of course. And so by working on that and giving them, like that heals you, like it helped, it healed me. And that's what heals you, you parenting your kids in that way. And it also like, so healing that, it, it healed me and it sort of, healed the childhood and 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 I'm now in a place where I don't need like like I don't think my mom's ever gonna like see these things or understand them like or like do anything particularly like I I think she probably knows some things but it's not like I don't think we're ever gonna sit down and talk about it or anything but I also don't need that anymore that's mm -hmm. that's gone it's just, I don't need that because I have moved past that via my own parenting and that's I think that's just super important because then yeah it's never too late <laughs> and if you think <laughs> that well then just like just get going do it start go you know like create the attachment that was I'm a trained psychologist and I'm just shooting my own business right down the foot when I say that I really believe that the best way to heal trauma is to go live a meaningful life and to not sit there and talk to your therapist and look at your own belly button, but rather do what's right and do the inner work. There's so much more to talk about with these things, but maybe it's beautiful to just land it with, it's never too late to have a good childhood, but find it by being a good parent.